Hello, hello, folks. Hello, hello, hello. It's Pastor Robert Johnson back for another edition uh, of Ignite uh, St. Mark United Methodist Church's Wednesday night com online conversation, online Bible study, online conversation that we do. And I am so excited about tonight. I'm excited every Wednesday night, but I'm very excited tonight. I, I have a new friend that I, re I ran across, to be honest with you, I ran across him on TikTok. TikTok. He's blowing up on TikTok. And I ran across him because I saw the title, The Nonpartisan Evangel Evangelical. And I know you all are hearing so much in the world right now about white evangelicals, about evangelicals, about the evangelical church, about the church period, about the fractures in the church. And I watched one of his videos and in just about 30 seconds, he spoke to the deepest worries and fears in my heart as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a pastor. And so uh, I reached out to him and lo and behold, as they say in the Bible, to use biblical language, lo and behold, that's all, that was every time that was used in the Bible, that means a miracle was about to occur. <laughs> lo and behold means something miraculous is about to happen. Lo and behold, he res he he responded. And we started talking and I invited him on and now he's on tonight and you're going to enjoy him so much. I am believing, let me tell you that I am believing that tonight is going to be healing for so many of us. Just stay, hey, hang in with us. Some cha challenging things will be said, but if we talk this through and listen, for, listen tonight prayerfully, this conversation is going to heal a lot of folks. I, I really believe that. And so we're so excited to have him on. I'm going to bring him on in just a second. In the meantime, I want to invite you to start a watch party. Start a watch party on your Facebook page. Invite some folks to come on and watch with you. If you know some young adults, hey, reach out to them and invite the young adults to come on. Tell them, hey, you got to come hear this, this pastor out of Fresno, California who's a middle-aged guy, but he is blowing up on face. He's blowing up on TikTok uh, doing these videos about politics and faith. And so I want you to tell your friends about him. Come on and invite them to watch, start a watch party, invite people to watch with you. And uh, we're going to have an amazing conversation. We also want to remind you that on Wednesday nights and during our night session, that we invite your comments and we will post those. We want we want this to be interactive. We want to dialogue with you. We wanna know what you're thinking. We wanna know how you're hearing us. And so feel free to share your, uh, share your comments and we will post as many of those as we can as we go along. I want Pastor Paul to know what people are, how people are hearing him, how they are responding to him so that he can know then how to address his comments as we go forward. So thank you all for coming on tonight, and uh, we're going to bring him on. Let me bring on Pastor Yolanda Oliver first, and she's on with us as our uh, co-host, and uh, she's going to help us and help uh, uh, engage with our audience and help us uh, uh, host Pastor Paul. And so now I present to you, Ignite audience, Pastor Paul Swearingen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's, Beautiful. Uh, he's a resident of Fresno, California. As a matter of fact, his wife was actually, uh, I don't know if she's still, uh, at one point she was the mayor of Fresno. Yeah, for two yeah. terms, so she was the mayor of Fresno from 2008, to, uh, paralleled President Obama's uh, term in the White House, 2008 to 2016. Awesome, wow, so that's good. And so many amazing facts. As a matter of fact, if you all wanna know more, more of his story, <clears throat> if you go to my Facebook page, I posted his bio there. You can go and read that and learn more. There's a lot. He's done so much stuff, fundraising. Uh, he's done uh, journalism. He's been a he's been a sports journalist, which just blew me away. I didn't know that's another thing we have in common. Is that a, as a matter of fact, as soon as we finish here tonight, I'll run to my TV to, to see what the update is on the NBA draft that's oh, going on tonight. Yeah. Yes, yes. So of course the draft will happen, and then the the trade wars will start will, will begin so but but pastor paul uh the other thing that's very interesting about him and i know i have a lot of friends out there uh who know that i have a deep 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 affection for bethel church in red reading uh california 
Uh, Pastor Bill Johnson, in my opinion, is one of the great biblical teachers of our time times who not only teaches the word, but uh, what he really does for me is that he helps me to uh, to be open and vulnerable to the supernatural move of God. And uh, and so Pastor Paul has, has some connections with that ministry. And if, I'll let him talk about that if he wants to at some point. But welcome, all of you. So we're going to get this conversation started. And what I want to do first, I just want to, for, for those of you that are watching, I want to show you a quick TikTok video. Can we start with the, can we, can I play that video, Paul? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So we'll start the video, but it, those of you, some of you, this video may rub you, but just, just hear it. And then let's have a conversation. Guys, we got to learn. I am so concerned about the body of Christ right now. My, I am so concerned that we no longer know how to disagree, that we, we are moving into a place of deep intolerance for different views. And that is so dangerous. It is not only dangerous to the body of Christ, it is dangerous for our country to move to a place where everybody's in a silo and people don't know how to engage in meaningful conversation across the aisles. And so I want to, I hope that Ignite will be a platform where we will learn to do that. So watch this video. It's just a 30 second video, about 30 seconds. Watch this video. And it'll set set the platform for our conversation tonight. And then if if it if you don't like some things or you think some things are uncomfortable for you, just hang linger and lean in, as they as the young people say, lean into this moment and let's explore together, trusting that God will give us a way forward. So here we go. Hi, everybody. Pastor Paul here. As I've been laying out my reasons for not voting for Donald Trump, one of the responses I get more often than any other is, what about abortion? Or did you know Joe Biden's a baby killer? My personal favorite. One of the things I want to do on these videos is help you to start to think differently. Just because you've been told something by your evangelical church your whole life doesn't make it true. You need to study it for yourself. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to what you've always known, to the age you're in, but be transformed by the ongoing renewal of your mind so that you can know what is good and right from God in a season. I have a different way I look at the abortion battle, and I'm going to do a series of videos on it coming up, so I hope you'll watch them, because I believe that our political struggle to impose a law on people is having the opposite effect that many of you passionately want to have around abortion. So I hope you'll join me. Watch my YouTube channel and go to my website at nppodcast.com. Wow. That is absolutely awesome. So, so many <laughs> things there. Number one, Yolanda, is I'm, I'm just, I just want to uh, congratulate Pastor Paul for how quickly he learned the TikTok platform and has maximized it and now has over 20,000 followers. Now watch this, Yolanda. So the, the story he tells is that, so was it the day before the election? Yeah, Monday before the election. Monday before the election, he has six followers. Pa Paul, you tell the story. <laughs> okay, all right. You tell the yeah. story. Uh, you know, I, I've... I've been a, an evangelical church pastor uh, for 10 years, and I stepped out of that two years ago, but had a sort of a, a word, a prophetic word from somebody that said, hey, you are a, uh, a man who takes a jackhammer to hard pan, because I've been trying to say to sort of this white evangelical church, hey, there might be a different way we can look at some of these things. And so the night before the election, I just had a sense in my spirit that God was saying, hey, your days of of pounding on hard pan are over and I'm gonna take you to a more fruitful field. And, and literally I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna move from Facebook to TikTok. And, and I already had a TikTok profile, but, but it, so the day after the election then is Wednesday night, I went to bed with six followers on TikTok. Uh, I woke up the next morning uh, and I told my wife, something's wrong, I've got 2,500 followers on TikTok. <laughs> and, and and all of a sudden I looked, and every time I looked, this number was going up, 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 up. And all of a sudden I realized this video that I had done, not that one you showed there, but a, but another one that I had talked about why I didn't feel like I could vote for Donald Trump was blowing up. And, and that video has now been viewed over 422,000 times. And uh, yeah, as you say, I now have about 20, 
20,500 followers on TikTok. So I feel like that was God saying, hey, I, you know, literally from kind of an older audience to this younger audience of people that are really going to want to hear what you have to say. And so it's it's just been fun and kind of mind boggling for me, to be honest. As a matter of fact, uh, another stat about your TikTok account is that over the last week, you've had something clo close to 200,000 views of your videos on which is amazing. And 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 so those of you that are watching, some of you probably have never heard of TikTok, but it's a new <laughs> social media platform. Uh, my daughter introduced me to it. As a matter of fact, our person, our media person who's not on tonight. I'm giving her a night off to rest. She would she she's missing it because she's from the moment COVID hit, she's been trying to get me to go TikTok. She and my daughter, as a matter of fact, were conspiring against me, Paul, to get me on TikTok. My daughter tried to secretly video me a couple of times dancing. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. It's 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 where the youngsters are, man. I got to tell you, it's where. It <laughs> and that's what's so wonderful about what's happening with you is because this important message of the kingdom that's that God is giving you is reaching young adults, which means number one, they're looking for hope. They are disgusted with the brokenness of the church, with the hypocrisy of the church. They're looking for hope. And number two, they're looking for uh, a, mess a message of the kingdom that represents love and reconciliation because that's the message that's coming through your video and it's reaching the next generation. So yeah. we we want to, Yolanda and I and St. Mark and all of our watchers, we we celebrate you. We're, we're, we're glad we've met you and uh, we want to uh, bid you Godspeed in your in your TikTok ministry and whatever else God <laughs> does above and beyond that. Now, now, Paul, so I know that you and I, I, I know a little about uh, the Bethel ministry. So was the, is that where you is that the ministry where you uh, gave your life where you became a Christian, became a believer? No, I, I grew up. My dad was a a pastor, an Assemblies of God pastor. So I grew up in an Assemblies of God home and and uh, had my first born again experience when I was six. So I, I've pretty much been a lifelong evangelical Christian, except for my sort of college pagan period. But uh, but other than that, I've I've been evangelical pretty much all my life. Wow. Wow. And so 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 this is I'd like for you to have you in your uh, you grew up Assemblies of God, which is 10th charismatic. Yep. Bethel Church is definitely charismatic. So that means you had some experiences in uh, speaking in tongues and prophetic uh, pro uh, uh, prophecy. So can you share? Because I just we have people who are in our audience who we, we believe in that, Paul. We embrace that. And so uh, can you share a little just to affirm for people? Because I what I want people to know is that you can be you can be anti-abortion. Uh, Pro justice and speak in tongues like those three things are not contradictory. Like you, those th that all those things represent the heart of God. Yeah. Could you, could you can you speak to that for a second? And I, I I believe you can vote for either candidate for president and do all of the above as well. Um, wow. But you know what I see <laughs> when yeah. I grew up. You know, the prophets were the guys that would come to our church and then you would, you know, you would hope you had confessed all your sin because they were going to start calling out people's sin in the room, you know. And and what I found out is is what I see as as prophetic is, you know, when Jesus sat with the woman at the well, he said, Hey, you've lived with five guys, or you've been married five times, and now you're living with a guy that you're not married with. And her response to Jesus saying that wasn't like, Yeah, I'm so ashamed of my lifestyle. No, what she said instead was, Oh, I perceive you're a prophet. He he told her something about herself that she that he couldn't have known without heavenly insight. And once he gave her that heavenly insight, she's like, Oh my gosh, this guy hears from heaven. And I I've seen this in action and had it happen through myself before that that heaven has just told me something about somebody. And when I say, hey, this may sound kind of weird, but I just I just feel like God wants you to know. And I tell them something that I couldn't know without hearing it from heaven. All of a sudden, they have a sense that God knows them and that God's aware of their presence on earth and it connects them to heaven. And so to me, that's what all of this is about is the prophetic is to help people know that God sees them and knows them and and and, and is aware of them. Because that's that's all we want to know at the end of the day is that that we're known and seen and matter and valuable. So that's 
the prophetic gift that I've learned and, and the healing gifts are just all about how do we connect a really good God with people and let them know they matter to God. So that's what I, I love about the gifts and about how Bethel sort of teaches them out to us. Wow. Wow. So, Paul, as we get into our discussion and our and folks, we're going to talk tonight because what without explicitly saying that what Paul is what he does is that he helps us to understand how Jesus transcends faith and tra and transforms it at the same time. So Jesus is bigger than po I mean, our politics. He trans he transcends politics, but he also transforms our politics. That's what we're going to get into. But to to set the platform for that discussion, I'd like to just give a moment to see, Paul, if there's a if you if there's a, a word from the Lord from you through you uh, to just launch our conversation, uh, we 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 love to hear that. Yeah, I, I was just you know sort of meditating with God before <laughs> I came on tonight, and and He just reminded me of Hebrews chapter twelve. Um, which was a Hebrews was written in a really tumultuous period in history and, and just a whole lot of crazy things were happening. And the Hebrews writer is saying, hang in there, you know, don't go back to this old religion. The new way is better. We're going forward. And Hebrews 12 has this, this passage about uh, once again, I will shake the earth. It says, but not only the earth, but the heavens as well. And, and and basically, my translation is it of ultimately God is saying, and what is of heaven will remain, and what is of earth will be shaken loose, and and so we're in a time I think that we're feeling a lot of tumult. There's some fear. It's like, what's going to happen? Are we are we going to kill each other? And and I just want to say it's it's not a unique moment in history. This is kind of a recurring part of human history. And sometimes I think God does shake us a little bit. He puts us in a sifter and shakes us up, and that's really uncomfortable, and we hate it because we want to be, we all want to be, you know, with our shepherd in the green grass. But sometimes he leads us through some some harder places to get to the other side. And so I, I just want to encourage people that I think what we're feeling is a shaking from heaven, so that what is of heaven will remain, and what is not will go away. So it's a it's a real mirror time, and that's uncomfortable. We're starting to see some ugliness in ourselves in the church. Some of us want to blind ourselves to it and say, no, no, nothing to see here and keep going where we're going. But I believe if we open our hearts, don't harden our heart like our fathers did in the desert, but open our hearts, that we're going to see something new that God has for us in the next season. And that shaking as uncomfortable it's going to be is going to take us into that new thing. So, so be at peace. God, I, well, if I can say one more thing, I don't mean to start preaching a sermon faster, but you know, no, 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 go, go, go. God once told me to so search. Hungry. We are so hungry for this. Go. God once told me to search the word comfort in the Bible and and what His thoughts were of comfort. And one of the things I found out is like almost always in the Bible, when the word comfort is there, it's a bad thing. You've become comfortable, and I don't want you to be comfortable now. He will comfort us when we go through the valley of the shadow of death. He'll provide comfort for us in the presence of our enemies. But if we choose comfort, then he starts to say, um, you're sleeping on ivory beds while others are suffering, and I want you to feel their suffering. And, and so this discomfort we're feeling is, I think God's saying, I want to shake you out of your comfort zone and get you into a place where the pain of people outside the walls of your church matters more to you than if you have really comfortable chairs in the church, if if the Amen. carpet is the right color or any of that other crap that we kind of get upset about sometimes. So I know it's an uncomfortable season, but but just be at peace in the middle of it because I think it's God doing something really good. Wow, that's a word. That's a word from the Lord. Thanks be to God, as we said. <laughs> that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, here's a comment from Tom Cotter. Oh, Tom's a friend of mine, yeah. <clears throat> I was in a little faith gathering on Zoom with Paul this past Sunday. There was a woman that joined the Zoom who had not been in church for years. She saw one of Paul's TikTok videos and wanted to be in conversation with people like that. Amen. 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 That we, hey Tom, we t I totally agree. Uh, when I saw one of his TikTok videos, it just hope just sprang eternal in my heart because I've been so dis. I gotta tell you, and I told Paul this. I felt so disillusioned about the church, uh, and I just shared with uh, Paul earlier. 
about a person that I'm that I went to uh, seminary with, and we're just really fractured right now. We were at one time really close friends, but we're really fractured right now. And I'm so disillusioned because I'm not fig. I can't figure out where the disagreement really is, and then I can't figure out how do we lose touch with what is the center of our faith, such to the point that we can't agree on on even basic things about the faith. So I agree, Tom. That's the same thing I think Paul is doing for a lot of folks out there, including a lot of young people. I think he's what he's doing is providing some hope. Paul, will you take us take a moment? And I I'm, I told you that I would ask you to do this and just uh, in your own way, in whatever way you think is important for this conversation right now, kind of share part of your faith journey, your faith story. Yeah, like I said, I grew up in a, a pastor's home. I was a pastor's kid. Um, I grew up in a home that I sort of half jokingly say Ronald Reagan and God were neck and neck as the greatest beings in the history of the universe. Um, very conservative. And, um, and I sort of translated Christianity this way, that if you did everything right on an ongoing basis, and then you see an 18 wheeler truck is about to come and send you into eternity and you say, oh, damn, you would get to the pearly gates and Peter would be there and he'd say, you almost made it, but you said, damn, and now you're going to hell. So <laughs> bummer for you. So uh, th this, this life of condemnation and, and feeling terrible. And, and so because I felt that God was that way to me, it made me be that way to other people. I wanted their life to be as bad as mine, you know? And, and so when I would see these people out there, I, like I remember John Lennon from the Beatles was a really evil guy. We just, I don't know, some reason we just thought he was a terrible guy. And as a, as that Christian kid, I looked and he, and I was like, he seems happy. And that makes me so mad. You know, he seems like he loves people and, and well, I wish I could love people too, but I know God doesn't want me to do that. So, so someday, you know, this rapture is going to happen and we'll be taken out of here and God will blow up those people. And I'll get to say, neener, 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 you know, look at that. And, and so that being sort of my faith basis, when I went into college and, you know, you start learning, there are other people out there that believe differently. And, and, and I was sort of angry from a lot of things. And, and so I decided, you know, forget God. Um, I'm going to hell anyway. So if I'm going to hell, uh, I'm going to live at least something of fun on earth. And so I went through, like I said, my pagan period, but, but, you know, God has a way of, of, you know, just grabbing your heart and drawing you back around. And, and so as I got out of college, went into my career, um, God began to draw me back. And I, I, I heard this pastor teach this sermon on hope uh, through a whole bunch of circumstances. And, and, and I just knew that message was for me. And, and then I, so I ended up connecting with that pastor and, and, and going to his house and, and there was this girl there and she was really amazingly attractive. And uh, so long story short, that now is my father-in-law and my wife. Um, and so God had really started bringing me back. And so my wife, had her, her father was a pastor. And so we started this journey together as, as we got married. And, and so we both came from very conservative households. But as we made a commitment in our life, and we got we both went to Fresno State, the college out here in Fresno, and we decided we were going to plant roots in Fresno. And Fresno has a lot of problems. We're sort of the everybody makes jokes about us in California. Johnny Carson used to make jokes about Fresno, you know, and, and we decided we were going to be a part of the solution here in Fresno or, or at least die trying. And and so we started seeing how we could sow into uh, our city being restored. Uh, Jeremiah 29, seven says, pray for the welfare of your city for in its, in its welfare, you'll find your welfare. And we just believe there was something God wanted to do in Fresno. And, and so that really began to change our theology towards a, a little less about, Hey, it's just about getting individual salvations and getting people to heaven. And, and a little more about how do we start to make to see the goodness of God here on this soil, as it says in Psalm 29, seven, I would have despaired if I didn't know I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And uh, so anyway, long story short, we're, we're, we're going through that. And, um, and that began to change a little bit of, of how we viewed the gospel as a social construct that, that God really did care about cities. And you may ask me more about that. So I won't go too much more into that, but then uh, uh, I, I 
had been a sportscaster, as you mentioned. Um, and then I got an opportunity to partner with some guys and, and buy a, a radio company. And just after I did that, God came and said, hey, you know, I called you to pastor a church when you were really young. And, and that had happened when I was about four years old. And so I told God, you know, there's no way in heck I'll ever pastor a church. And suddenly that happened. And so ended up, we planted a church. And just as we were getting ready to do that, my wife said, hey, I think I'm supposed to run for mayor of our city. <laughs> so, so we ended up planting a church and my, mayor, uh, my wife running for mayor in the same year. Uh, we had some friends say, you guys are going to be divorced in a year, which we're like, hey, thanks for that input. Um, but that just was really life changing for us. So we've just been pursuing this idea that the goodness of God is what's supposed to come through the gospel and it should change a city. And, and we just keep pursuing that. And I stepped out of, of leading the church two years ago and started doing a podcast, wrote a book. And, uh, and sort of this is the road we're pursuing now. So it's it's just really exciting to start to share this message that God's been transforming us with in our hearts and, and really to start to speak it out. So you mentioned just then about God wants us to, how God wants us to care for the cities or God's care for the city. Go ahead and talk more about that, Paul. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, Jeremiah 29, seven is a really important verse for us. Um, but I began to realize that that all through the Bible, you see God speaking into people groups, nations, we call them, or cities. Uh, and, and so he would say, you know, hey, Jerusalem, you're not taking care of the poor, the foreigner, the ostracized, the outcast. And, and my judgment is on you for that. And again and again, we see Israel being punished, not, not for the sins that we might list, but because they had forgotten about justice for the poor and the foreigner, the sojourner, the, the outcast, the ostracized, the widows. And, and that really began to take root of like, hey, this kind of matters to God. But, you know, that's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. And then I started reading the Bible, which is a really dangerous thing to do sometimes. And I, I saw that Jesus spoke to people groups as well. He said, hey, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. You know, I don't think everybody in Jerusalem ever killed a prophet, but he said, hey, the, the spirit of this city is like when somebody comes and gives you a message you don't like, you run them off or you, you spiritually kill them. Wow. Um, and then later he was standing over Jerusalem and he was just in agony like, oh, Jerusalem, I would have saved you if you had just wanted me to. I would have saved you. But instead, now you're going to choose Barabbas the zealot who wants to overthrow the government instead of choosing me, the suffering servant Messiah. And, and then there we have these, this list of woes to the city. And this one really jumped out at me that he said, hey, Capernaum, you know, on judgment day, it's going to be better for Sodom than you. And I, I was like, whoa, wait a second. I never saw that verse in the Bible before. And, and we know what Sodom, we all know what Sodom is about. And we think gay marriage is, is something God cares about more than anything else. And here's Jesus saying, Capernaum, which by the way, was his headquarters. He did more miracles in Capernaum than any other city. He spent more time in Capernaum than anywhere else. So they saw the goodness of God. They saw the, the amazingness of the message and they went, yeah, it's not that important to us. And Jesus said, that's worse. That's worse than what Sodom was guilty of. That makes me more angry and upset. And so just seeing the way Jesus looked at people in people groups and, and how there was this judgment and knowing that doesn't mean every individual in there. And, and, and I began to look at the church and how we were translating what we read in the Bible and how we were treating people out of it and ultimately how we were chasing the young, the, the millennials and the Gen Zers, the next two generations away from the church with our politics. And it just started changing something in me. And I'm like, if God wants to, to have a city repent and have justice and care, but we're chasing people off because of these few social issues that we choose to be really important, something's not in alignment here. And, and I saw that, you know, Jesus said, hey, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, that leaven of the Pharisees makes them blind. They, they can see the sky and know what the weather is, but they, they look right at the Messiah standing in front of them and they don't know who he is. And they've been waiting for him for 400 years. And I said, man, evangelical church, this looks like us. This looks like us. We, we want to impose laws and rules and, and bondage on people with our condemnation. And Jesus said, I came to set people free from that. And I want cities to have justice. I'm like, 
man, I grew up wanting to love people. And now God is telling me I can because Jesus loved people and the religious guys hated him for doing it. And in that he said, oh, Jerusalem, I would have just grabbed you and hugged you up and held you like a mother hen. And, and it, so it just started saying to us like, hey, this stuff really matters to God. And so as we started pouring into that, looking at our city of Fresno, we started seeing the thing that was keeping us from being able to turn the city around was, was this abject inequality of opportunity for economic advancement. We, we, were, we were judged to be one of the most racially and, and economically separated cities in the country. Um, redlining was a big thing in the 60s in our city, that there was a line on the map, a red line, and it said, hey, not only blacks, but Armenians and all these races were not allowed to buy a home north of that red line. And the federal government put that in place. Then when that was outlawed, it was still unofficially done in Fresno almost into the 80s. Uh, it would be written into leases. You cannot sell this home to a Japanese person or a black person. But mostly for us, our black community was so segregated into a small area of our town. And God began to say to us, if you live in Northwest Fresno, as we do, I, I admit it, we live in one of the nicer parts of town, not the nicest because we're not quite th there. But, but if I don't care about that segment of Fresno, I don't care about me because it's the welfare of my city that brings my welfare, not just the welfare of my kids or my relatives or, or my household. And so all of that started making us say, hey, maybe God cares about more than just getting people to say a sinner's prayer. Maybe he cares more than just about going after these little social single issue things that matter to us, but he wants to see our city change. And in that salvation will come to a group of people. So I hope that answers your question, but that's really what the journey has looked like for us. Rich stuff. That's what you, you could just keep right on going. <laughs> that is such rich stuff. Uh, that's my mom, Paul. I thought I'd show you that. She, oh, hi, Ella. She, she's in Mississippi. Hi, mom. As you can oh. see, Okay, think she's worried about me and sickness, but I'm fine. I am fine. So thank you. I, yeah, I'm glad you're better. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm glad too. Uh, what a rough past few days. So, so Paul, let's talk. You, I've I've heard you say something that was really helpful to me. I know that I am anti-abortion. I know you are, but but we both think that the part of the church that is anti-abortion is attacking the issue in the wrong way, in a way that's counterproductive. Would you talk about that for a second? Yeah, and I know this is a hard one for people. I, I know people are passionate about saving the unborn and, and I will never get on anybody about that. I think it's, a, a, a be it's coming from a beautiful passion of your heart. But the problem is our battle to impose a law to ban it, as I said in that video, has, has really had the opposite effect that we wanted to have. For one, it doesn't stop abortion from happening. And, and it's really been divisive in our culture. We are at the heart of the division in our culture because we're politically trying to, to put an abortion ban in place. And I think if, if we were willing to see Jesus the Messiah as a suffering servant rather than a governmental conqueror, as the Pharisees wanted him to be, they wanted that Messiah to come take over government. And when he wouldn't do it, they said, we better kill this guy. Otherwise, we're going to lose our religion and lose our country. Um, and I think if we would become a follower of that suffering servant, God would give us a solution to abortion in our country. By the way, just let me give you a stat. South yeah. Korea has banned abortion for 60 years now. That, that just recently got overturned by their Supreme Court. But, but it's been outlawed in South Korea for 60 years. And in South Korea, there are more abortions per capita that occur than in the United States. Wow. And, and so a, a ban is not going to solve wow. the problem. And, and I believe if we laid down oh, that battle. Oh, hold on. That's, I okay. want to pause because I want to make sure people get that stat. So they outlawed, they outlawed abortion in Korea. South it Korea, yeah. The past 60 years, South Korea. Which is a very Christian nation, by the very way. Very. Yet they had more abortions there, with it being outlawed. They had more abortions than we were than were going on than were happening in America during the same time. That is that is that has to be eye opening to folks to you folks as you're listening to that that we are attacking the issue the wrong way. Paul, I'm sorry for interrupting. Ah. you. 
thing. I just wanted to make sure we grab that stat. Yeah, more abortions per capita. Of course, they have way less people than we do. But um, and what they found is, you know, rich people got safe abortions and poor people got really unsafe abortions, which is what I fear would happen in the United States if if we were to to pass a law. The other stat to know is that recently Alabama and Missouri passed very restrictive abortion laws. And when that happened, polls showed that support for abortion shot through the roof that that, you know, about half the people of America were, were you know, we were split 50 50 on abortion in a lot of ways. Uh, but when uh, when those laws passed, support for it really shot up. So I, so I think if we really looked and saw the fruit of this battle and then understood that that these staunch sort of right wing stances are chasing our young people from the church, we might say, God, have we have we got a little bit out of alignment with you? And, and here's the beautiful thing I see that if our goal was to stop unwanted pregnancy, everybody can get behind that. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. Nobody celebrates unwanted pregnancy. So let's look for solutions for unwanted pregnancy. And that can be education. That can be contraceptives, although I know that's a little bit of a, of a controversial issue. But contraceptives do stop abortions from happening very much. So in fact, abortions are at a pretty low ebb in the United States right now. But if, if we did that, and then and then the other thing, poverty, you know, Poverty is a big part of abortion. The impoverished people have way more abortions per capita than wealthy people do for a whole lot of reasons. So if we went after poverty, if we started providing good health care for people, child care for people, these are things that could entice a young couple that find themselves in a difficult position to say, hey, we can have this baby and still live the life we dream to live. Uh, and the church then could be the leader of doing something amazing and caring for people instead of trying to impose our will through a political battle that that really has hardened our hearts. So I, I think God has a solution for this, Pastor Johnson, if we just were willing to lay down our battle and lay down our sword and say, OK, God, we'll sacrifice that political win if you'll show us a way to see babies truly saved uh, in the way that our hearts want that to happen. Man, I I tell you something. When 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 God's people stop caring about winning and stop caring about power and getting our way and really care about people, something absolutely amazing happens. Because as you're talking about that, that's what I hear in you, Paul. Is that is that your concern is not how do we win a win a a, a, a political battle not how we win a social battle, social discussion, not how we keep power or whatever, but how do we care for people? And that just, that compassion just comes through because I think when we really care about people and we're compassionate about people, then we find there are so many ways that God has, as a matter of fact, uh, audience Paul said to me the other day and just brought tears to my eyes. He says, God is saying to us, man, I got I got lots of solutions to the to the issue of abortion. But if y'all would just stop fighting and just like put your swords down and listen, I've got untold ways of us to to come to come against abortion. Yeah. yeah and I actually I actually think he's saying, uh, yeah. I'll let you keep going. If that's what you want to do, I'll sit back and let you keep going. But it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. And, and I think he's done that through history. And, and the other thing I would say is, is fighting it as a political battle, I think, has made us hard hearted, like I said. And we've started to then equate other issues in with that. So now it has become that the Republican platform is, is now the Bible. You know, that, that we now equate not only abortion with this, but, but taxes. You know, taxes have become a godly battleground for us when Jesus specifically twice addressed the issues of taxes. And both time it was to say once, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and the other time say, so we don't offend, let's pay the tax that I don't own and get that out of the way so we can move on with the ministry. And, and so I think not only has it caused us to sort of miss what God's doing in the season, but start to add other things in that are even extra biblical or anti-biblical, because now we're fighting to win a political battle rather than just have a righteous move to see something good from God happen. Man, just such awesome stuff. Those of you that are watching, 
Uh, we, we're at 740. We've got another another 30 minutes or so. We're going to go to 815. So you you may have missed half, but you get you got half left to go. So start a watch party, invite some folks to come on. I believe, Paul, this may be your wife. I want to post her comment. That is my wife. Look at her. I told you she was a tr she was beautiful, didn't I? She is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, both you and and the city of Fresno are very blessed to have her presence there. Thank you, Ashley, for for tuning in. Thank you for allowing your husband to be with us tonight. Uh, he has. I've just met him a couple of weeks ago, I think, and uh, I just have the grace of God has just uh, been poured out through him into me. And so, thank you for sharing him with us. We become pawns of political operatives whose hearts are not kingdom aligned. Perfect statement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ashley, we should have her come on a little with next week. Paul's going to be back with us next week. I've invited him to come back for two weeks. And so he's going to be back next week. Maybe Ashley can come on with him. We'd love to have her have you on. And uh, to, to uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of our young adults. I am so glad she's watching. That's All right. <laughs> she's a young musician. She is one of those people that we're talking about these young people who are understanding that the church has to be reformed, not only theologically, but structurally. If Kyron Green is listening, Kyron Green is the guy who planted that statement with me that we've got to think about not just theological uh, reformation, but also structural. We've got to change how we do church. And Santia is one of the people who's doing that already. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Donna Hodges, that's one of our members. As a matter of fact, Paul, this is one of the uh, young, uh, one of the ladies in my church that I told you about that uh, she and her family are, that we're on different sides of the political spectrum, but we absolutely love each other. Donna Hodges absolutely loves her pastor. Jim Hodges absolutely loves his pastor and I love them. There's not a political issue in the world that could come between me and the Hodges. And I love you all so much. Donna, thank you for watching tonight. Paul, you you tell, you have a parable and Yolanda's gonna love this. This is an amazing, do the parable that that I that you do, uh, by the way, and then talk about the book, talk a little about the book and then, but tell the parable first and then talk a little about the book that you have out. Are you talking about the parable I did today on TikTok? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I'll just, I'll just do this, the 60 second version I did today. And it, it's, it's, uh, so, so Jesus was on Facebook and, and, uh, was, was perusing his social media when he got a message from a woman and she asked this question, what must I do to be a really, really good Christian? Uh, Jesus seeing her message typed his response and sent it back to her. He said, well, you must oppose abortion and gay marriage and you must never say swear words. Uh, never listen to loud rock music and tell your grandkids not to get on that TikTok thing. <laughs> the woman saw his message and she was so pleased. And she says, yes, all of these things I've done since I was a little girl. And Jesus saw her reply and he, his heart just went out to her. He loved her so much. And he began to type again. And he said, just a few more things I would encourage you to do if you want to be a really, really good Christian. He said, you need to go to the local abortion clinic and meet an expectant mother there and offer that if she keeps her baby, you'll pay for her child care and her health care for the rest of that baby's life so that she can go to school. And then I want you to go to your neighbors, that gay couple in your neighborhood, and I want you to become their friend and find out their story. And then I want you to go to the office of the local liberal politician. I want you to take a selfie with that person and declare on social media that you're going to pray for that leader every single day. Jesus sent his message and waited. Not hearing back, he finally decided he would respond to the lady and see if she was okay. But when he tried, he was surprised to find out she had unfriended him and blocked him from her social media. Oh, how difficult it is for Christians to live the life I displayed in the Bible, said Jesus. So that is my parable I of the really, that. really good Christian. I love that. I love that. And, and so uh, what you do with that, Paul, it can really be applied to all of us because, you know, we can replace each one of us has to replace those three persons that Jesus sends her to. We have to replace those with people, with the three kinds of people that we are challenged to love, that we are challenged to support and know that Jesus is calling us to drop our words and 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 stop attacking people as enemies. 
and to 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 demonstrate the love of God for them. Uh, and to begin there with whatever disagreements we, we may have with them, to begin in a place of compassion and love. And that's what that parable does for me. You can hear you can hear that parable on TikTok. If you didn't get all of you, you want to rehear it. So I, I bet this is what's going to happen. All of my seniors who are watching tonight are going to get a TikTok account. <laughs> We're going to drive up the, the mean age of TikTok. I can't say that's a revelation from God, but I just feel like that that's what's going on. Michelle <laughs> said yours will be posted by Sunday. St. Mark will have a TikTok page by Sunday. Th thank you, Tom. Uh, here's the link to it, uh, to Paul's TikTok. Thank you for that. Uh, yes. So we'll put that back up and then we'll post it on the Facebook page, on St. Mark's Facebook page, so you all can get it. Uh, Michael Bruce, one of our members, says, I love it. Uh, Doris Wilson wants us to know she's listening, and uh, God bless. And so good comments coming in. So, Paul, I know you have a, a book out that's a uh, – so tell us about the book and and uh, how it came about, and then tell us about the content and anything else you might want to say about Can it. Can I show you one? So that, whoops, where is it? Yep, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's called Joseph Comes to Town, and it has a, you know, a little bit of a clickbait subheadline that says uh, when the religious right goes religiously wrong, um, and and so it's a novel. I I had some concepts, and people were prophesying over me. You're going to write a book. You're going to write a book, and and I thought, you know, the world needs another Christian book, like it needs a hole in the head. We have plenty of Christian books out there, and, and then I just felt inspired from a, from a friend, and he said, you know what, Jesus told stories. Jesus didn't, you know, write books and do these heavy, he, he told stories to people. Why don't you tell a story? And I had always had this imagination in my head of if Jesus were in Fresno, California today in the flesh, what would he say to the evangelical church compared to what he said to the church of his day? And I'd always had that imagination. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to sit down and write this out. And and the, the book is semi-autobiographical. It's some of my experience and my wife's experience. Um, but it's a, it's a book about a very conservative town in a very liberal state, which is kind of what California and Fresno is. And there's this a megachurch pastor who is sort of the evangelical right-wing leader in his town. And all of a sudden, this mysterious young man shows up and he starts doing miracles and he starts teaching these strange teachings and he starts critiquing the politics of the church, which creates creates a crisis that, that ultimately, not to ruin the end of the book, but helps the pastor realize, like I said, again, a little bit of an autobiographical story. He realizes that he's worshiping a harsh God and so he's displaying a harsh God to others. But when he learns that Romans 2 tells us that it's the kindness of God that draws us to repentance, not his harsh rules, it changes everything for him. But it causes us some problems, too. So uh, I, I really love how the book turned out. We self-published it uh, in the last year here. And uh, so I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, you know, uh, writing a book is like having a child, you know, now it's kind of your little baby and and you hope it does well. But But I hope it really blesses people if they get to read it. Yes. So hold it up again so folks can see it. Uh, <laughs> Joseph comes to town. So say, Mark, get ready. We'll do we'll do a book club on it and we'll read it and read it. Nice. To those of us that would like to do that. Uh, uh, there's a I have a lifelong friend who's watching tonight and we all just to see he's this is everybody's got a one crazy friend. This is my <laughs> friend <clears throat> so all right maryland is a crazy place right <laughs> so absolutely so paul so uh it's 7 49 so we want we are going to by the way folks we're going to spend some time uh praying for we want to pray for you all tonight so i want i want paul to pray for you all and we're just going to kind of get come to a moment where we're going to kind of flow in that and just kind of see if god gives us some words uh, of, of wisdom or knowledge for the moment and just pray for some folks. So we want to make time for that. So if you've got some, I know we're all praying for all the families that are impacted by COVID. We're praying for those who are taking care of the folks who are impacted by COVID. We're praying for the people who are trying to lead in these very uh, trying times, whether they be political leaders, educational leaders, uh, civic leaders, folks, this is a tough time to be a leader. Hey, pastors, 
I mean, pastors are really struggling because, you know, that we keep setting these deadlines for when we think things will be back to normal. And every time we hit a dead, hit that mark, uh, things get even worse. So we don't know. So these are tough times. So we're praying for leaders of all sorts, praying for families. And so we'll spend some time time doing that. But if you have some personal prayer concerns that you like to send up, send to us, and we'd like to pray for you tonight. But well, I, I've asked Paul to do this. I really want my prayer right now is, and, and this is including me, okay? The, your argument, the arguments I'm making any, you know, your, your what you thought of these well-reasoned arguments aren't, aren't in any ground. People aren't, you know, I can put out something that I think, oh, this is really going to help the other side see things are different. That That's not working now. And nothing so changing. it's not, nothing is changing. It's just getting worse and worse. And so what, what I feel God is saying to me right now, Paul, is stop hurling stones. And why not start praying for uh, praying for revelation from all sides and praying for common ground and praying for humility. So that's that's what that's where I'm beginning to pray. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna when I do a TikTok, that's one of, that's one of the things I'm gonna do is do a prayer moment where we talk about, hey, let's let's pray for peace and let's pray for revelation, so that for all of us that whatever things we see that may be right, that others will see it, but that what we are what we're wrong, that we will see that as well about ourselves. So I've asked Paul to help us. How, what do you think? What are some things that God has given you to help all of us in the in the body of Christ? Whether you be liberal, uh, e- evangelical, uh, Pentecostal, charismatic, from all the wings of the church, that we can begin to come together and try to bring some healing for the body of Christ. Yeah, thank you for asking that. And and I and and the quick backstory on this is my wife and I have been on a journey to realize some things in ourselves, uh, and particularly in the area of, of race relations that, that we didn't recognize were there in us before, just, just being unaware of what we were unaware of. And, and so over the last maybe year or so, um, in fact, I, I, I was reading Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail on New Year's Day a, while, a couple of years ago and, and read this, you know, him saying, I'm most disappointed in the white moderates. And it just struck me. Uh, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, if if I had lived in the 60s, would I be one of those white moderates? And I realized I couldn't be that anymore. And and so my wife and I have undertaken to hearing the stories of of our friends from our communities of color. And and we've had to hear some hard things and some things that were pretty offensive to us, to be honest with you. And we decided, man, we are not going to defend ourselves. We are, we're not going to get offended. We want to hear all of it. And it's, and it's so impacted us. And my wife's doing amazing work in the civic sphere that maybe she can tell you about next week. But it just reminds us that Second Chronicles 7, 14 is a verse we, we all love in the church. And, and we go to these prayer breakfasts and you hear Second Chronicles 7, 14. And that verse is always sort of translated this way. If those people out there would stop doing what they're doing and repent, then God would bless our country. I love that verse, don't you? Because that verse takes all responsibility away from me completely. That's awesome. If those people who do that and those people who do that and those people who do that. Yeah, those people. Exactly. Exactly, Pastor Oliver. But that verse actually says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, which I means, which I think means seek what I'm doing in the season, seek my ways, turn from their wicked ways, then then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so my prayer out of that for everybody, pastors, is if we would just be willing to humble ourselves, and that's scary, that's risky, that's dangerous, but but that's where God says, I'll bring you comfort. If you humble yourself, I will bring the comfort. If you're going to do it on your own, I'll stand back and let you go. But if you're humble, I'm there with you in the valley of the shadow of death, in the most vulnerable, scary time, I'm there. And so that's where God comes running in and says, yes, that is where I can go and do my work. And so whether you're 
for this candidate or that candidate on this side or that side or believe this is the biggest issue or that one, would we just be willing to humble our hearts and say, okay, I want to hear the hard things. I want to hear the things that tell me I'm wrong. I want to hear the things that that pinch, you know, like Jesus said, hey, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then he said, who's going to hang around when I say that hard thing? And a whole bunch of people said, I am out of here if that's the story. And I think God is telling us today. And so I, what I pray is over the hearts of people, Pastor Johnson, is that 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 they have the courage to be the poor courage. in spirit, the courage to be meek, mm. because blessed are those that are poor in spirit and meek and are willing to lay down what they have for their neighbor, for their brother, and for their enemy that we really show our devotion to God by loving that person that we don't think deserves God's love. And so that's my prayer for everybody. God, just bless our hearts with that courage. Wow. I just want to show you uh, uh, some of the comments uh, that are coming in here. Uh, Dora Youngblood says, good word. Curtis Johnson says, amen, brother. Uh, Michael Bruce, that's that's one of our members that he says, haven't I been saying this over six years? <laughs> that's one of his favorite scriptures. If my people who are calling my name, Philip Oliver, that's Pastor Oliver's husband, says, Amen. That's just such a good word. And and I I want to say, and I and I pray that this will be a model for all of our listeners. So when you say that, Paul, about if they would just do, I laugh because I often take that posture. As a matter we of fact, I start. When and when in a lot of my Facebook posts, it's it's talking about what I what other people need to do or what how they need to think, or how they need to see things, and that's God's just been saying to me. But so, you know, that's that's very nicely worded. But who whose heart are you really changing? Mm, that's right. I, I do think there is a time for us to call out evil. Yeah. Um, or, or call out things that are wrong, but but I I I I think if we do it with a humble heart, I, I think Jesus was able to do that and keep his heart humble, and and loving the unlovely, and and we can see things change. Wow, wow, Pastor Yolanda, I've dominated the questions. You have any co comments, questions you want to? No, first I want to. Can we acknowledge um, Sister Linda's comment? I think that's. Oh, sure, the, yes, that's my wife right there. I uh, almost forgot to show that. And she's sending that to both you and your wife. God bless you, Paul and Ashley. I admire the two of you opening yourselves up to realities outside of yours. What a great statement. Is that wow. not the key? Is that that's not the key? key? What a great, thank you. Thank you for that, Linda. What a great statement. Opening yourselves up to realities outside of yours, your own. Man, what a great statement. And that's exactly, Doesn't yes. Doesn't mean that I have to agree with it. Doesn't mean that I have to accept it for myself. I just need to be open to allowing you to be who you are and to feel and believe what you choose and loving you for it. That's all. Can, can I say an amen to that? That is such a good statement. That I love that. When, when unity became about agreement, that's when we become tribes. That That's when we become tribes that go to war. But unity is not agreement. Unity is I'm with you even when we disagree. So I, I love that statement. That's powerful. Wow. 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 Keep going, Pastor Yolanda. Keep going. I just, I, in my mind, as I'm sitting here thinking, and I'm known to be just a bit weird, but I'm just thinking, I just wish that whatever it is that you've got going on in you, that it becomes the new Rona and infects everyone because you, you you give it in such a simplistic way to where it automatically captures your attention and it and it's you're like okay i can feel that and then it you have a mirror moment or you hope that people have a mirror moment to where they begin to stop looking at everyone else and pastor johnson and i were in a deep debate last night and he kept talking to me about courage people having the courage to step outside of the culture and do what's right in spite of what we drug our heels into the sand and decided to take on as our platform, whatever it is that it might be. And just getting to the point where we're willing to let go of that, we're no longer going to defend it. 
We're no longer going to try and justify it. But I don't, I also don't have to be silent in that. Let me go and love you. I don't care if you're black, white, gay, straight, Republican, whatever it is, just embracing you as another human being. Loving on the least of these, like he says, and we do it every day where we block out Jesus, where we just automatically put him on mute. Awesome parable. I saw another comment where someone mentioned the fact that your book is full of similar parables to that. And I think people have, have Pastor Rose Booker Jones um, does a sermon about fresh Jesus. And that's what that's the vibe that you're giving me. You're giving me fresh Jesus in a simple, simplistic way, just taking us back to the foundations of what it is and how it is that we should emulate Christ. Simple. Yeah. yeah and I, I think that's really important because we contextualize the Bible and, you know, we read the story of the Good Samaritan and it doesn't pinch us. We that's we it. don't hate Samaritans. But so, you know, the the. Jesus character who's named Joseph in my book tells the story of the good the good Muslim who saves the illegal immigrant on the side of the road while the other people pass by because Jesus went right after their soft spots with these stories he went right after what they most hated and the and he made the Samaritans the people they felt justified by God to hate and he made that Samaritan the hero of the story and and so that's what I love to do is try to port so, you know, that that parable I did was the rich young ruler, which I think a lot of you figured out. And and we need to port those stories into our age so we understand what Jesus was saying to the audience that he was talking to at the time. So I try to make those stories pinch us a little bit so that we go, ow, and and then try to think about, uh, you know, Pastor Bill Johnson says, God will, uh, will offend our minds to get to our hearts. Yes. And so... You know, so when we're offended by something we hear by some jerk like me, we have to decide like, okay, God, am I going to allow myself to be offended or am I going to run from that? Or am I going to discount that? Or am I going to hear what you have for me to hear? So that's that's really what I'm trying to do with those parables. And allow the pitch to be your growth. You know, that's where it's in the valleys. I think I've heard said it's in the valleys that we grow. We run from growth. We run from challenges. We run from pain. We run from anything that is outside of our comfort zone. Mm. And that's what we've done as a, I think as a people, as Christians, as a country, we've grown comfortable and we needed something to shake us up. And so I think I want to go back and uh, into that, to Linda's statement again, I, uh, opening yourselves up to reality outside of your, your own is just so important. Uh, you know, Jesus was so good at using stories to do that. Uh, I, I will say, Paul, that, you know, as I was struggling with Lord, so how do we communicate to truth or communicate good news to people who, with closed hearts? And, uh, you TikTok. know, the, the prophet Nate, TikTok. <laughs> short video, short to the point. That's how you do it. There's the answer, Paul. There, there are some people who don't like me very much on TikTok. Hey, that God interrupted what what I was about to say. Like Yolanda, answer. I'm sorry, not listening. And say what I need. This is what I want him to say. TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> uh, but but the prophet Nathan ran into that same problem, right? When David uh, had committed adultery and and then killed Uriah, and uh, and and you got to know that the that the king's court they were all afraid to say anything to him. And so even Nathan knew that I can't just go in and tell him what he did. He I mean, he'll, he may ha he'll have me killed. So he goes in and he tells a parable. He tells a story because he knows that beneath that that secrecy that there's a heart for God. And so yeah. he tells a story about injustice. And David jumps up and says, "Who who did this? How dare he? This happen in my kingdom." And Nathan says, you're the man, you're the one, you're the one. So uh, there is a power to parables. And and so, uh, and I appreciate that you are picking up on that. And uh, and maybe that's something we need to delve and, and talk more about so we can develop a culture of that in the church, Paul, for these times. Yeah, I, I, I read somebody brilliant recently who said, 
uh, they called it the Disney princess effect of reading the Bible. And, uh, you know, when we read the Esther story, we're, we're always Esther or Mordecai. We're never Haman, you know. Uh, you know, we, we read the, the Jesus and the, and, and the woman caught in adultery, you know, we're, ne we're never the ones with the rocks and, and we need to read the story and say, would I be one of the people holding the rocks there? You know, of course, let's tell her, go and sin no more. And Jesus is like, no, first you have to chase away the condemners and the condemnation. Right. And then you have to pronounce complete forgiveness. So after you've put your reputation and even your life on the line for that sinner, and chased away all the condemnation and pronounced forgiveness, then you can say, hey, now I've earned the right to ask some questions about how you're living your life. Wow, That's very different than how we handle go and sin no more in the church today. And, and so, yeah, we need to look at ourselves and say, could, could I possibly be the one holding the rock in the story? And maybe I'm missing that. Wow. Wow. So, uh, Paul, I want to, here's a question for you. From Marie Jose, how do we unify with someone who is either consciously seeking to harm or destroy you or supports policies or politics that do? Um, so there is a time to boundary people. Now I'll go into my coaching, you know, sometimes, because I hear this a lot, you know, agree to disagree. And, and there are things that I can't agree to disagree with you on. Uh, you know, I think racism is an issue right now that we cannot agree to disagree on. This is a this is a seminal moment where this is primary on God's heart. And so I'm not going to tell you it's OK to be racist. I'm not going to tell you it's OK to say good people on both sides. It's not OK. It hurts God's heart immensely. But we have to be really open to hearing our own foibles and our own blind spots so that we don't start thinking ourselves morally superior to others in that. So first I think is, is um, softening your heart and being willing to hear your own blind spots. And then, you know, what Nathan did with David there, and I love the way you told that story, Pastor, it, you know, he came as David's champion, as somebody who loved David. He didn't want to destroy David. He wanted David to be his best. And so out of love, he came and said, hey, I'm going to have to tell you this thing because I want you to succeed and be your best. So if we go in to take somebody down and destroy them and grind them down, we're not coming with the heart of Jesus. But if we say, hey, I love you enough, I'm going to fight for relationship, even if we disagree, and I'm going to tell you a hard truth because I want you to be successful, then we can be successful. So it, it, it really starts with my heart and where I'm coming from. I say some really hard things to people and it makes them really mad. And sometimes I have to say, hey, I'm talking to the spirit that's over the evangelical church right now. And if that's pinching you, you ask God about why that's pinching you. I'm not trying to beat you up, but I'm going after a spirit that's impacting us all. So we just have to have a heart to say, I want the best for you, but out of that, I'm willing to tell truth. You, uh, your love, uh, just, it is, it comes across. I just want you to know that, that it comes and how you talk about not only God, but how you talk about God's people. There's just an overflow of grace and love that comes through. And uh, I really, really appreciate that about you. And I also want to thank you, uh, Yolanda Noel, I am relentlessly focused on, um, the, on, on Jesus, re, you know, re, rediscovering, representing Jesus for our times. Uh, you all have to mute for a second as I'm talking. I don't know what's going on with our that the echo. Is it still there? Okay. No, it went away. Okay. So that, but I, I appreciate throughout this entire conversation, you have just relentlessly returned to Jesus stories and Jesus teachings. That's so important. Uh, you and I had a conversation earlier this week, and we talked about how Jesus measures everything, including Paul. So. You know, if somebody's reading the Bible and they're reading in Paul and they says, but Paul says this and it seems to disagree with what Jesus says, then we don't we we submit Paul to Jesus. Uh, Jesus measures Paul. And so you've done that tonight. I want to thank you so much. One more comment. And then if you all will start sending your prayer requests and prayer concerns, it's 809. We'll finish at 815. So we want to spend the last five minutes praying for folks. I do want to put this comment up. This is from one of not only. Uh, 
a friend of St. Mark, but also one of, a, uh, I consider a leading ci uh, citizen in the city of Wichita, a leader, a good man, a beautiful family, says Pastor Johnson, Oliver, White, Paul, this has been truly an awesome and enlightening. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, John, for watching tonight, brother. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, we'll cut John, come back with us next week. And so we're gonna continue our conversation with Paul. And uh, I'm probably gonna bring on Kyron Green because I want Paul and Kyron to have some conversation. Uh, they're both having this conversation about what, what will it look like for us to restructure, the, to, to talk about restructuring church, how we do church and what that looks like. And then hopefully uh, maybe Paul's wife will be on with us for a little bit, Pastor Yolanda. Uh, so we'll see who, what other guests we'll bring on with us. So if you have a prayer request, uh, we want to take a moment and send, if you'll send that in and then we just want to pray for you. So again, we're praying for pastors and leaders, praying for all the families. I am uh, so heartbroken for all the people who have lost loved ones during this COVID crisis. Uh, and not only the people who have died from COVID, but in St. Mark, we've had a lot of death this year and that was not COVID related. Mm. It's just been a year of a lot of death passing. And so we, Pastor Yolanda and I certainly want all those families to know that we have not forgotten about you. Uh, I am I am heartbroken that we haven't been able to come back together physically, only because I, I, I'm, I, I'm a tangible lover. I like to hug on people and I like to flash my smile and through my eyes and contact, let people know I love them. And I haven't been able to do that to so many families who had loved ones to die. But you, you all know that St. Mark, the St. Mark family, Pastor Yolanda and I and the staff, we love you and we're here for you. And we have, we God will empower us to support you in the way that you need to su be supported in the days to come. And please do not hesitate to call the church if you need anything. We do want you all to know that we're expecting to be able to offer the saliva COVID, COVID test, which is a much easier test. You don't have to have a stick, uh, a, a tree, plunge up into your brain. <laughs> All you have to do is, is spit in a tube and uh, you get your results back in a matter of hours, usually the same day. It may be 24 hours, just depends on when the lab receives the, uh, the, the uh, tests. But we're hoping that maybe next start next week that we'll be able to offer that to our members so that you can have that, particularly as you have visitors coming in for the holidays. It'd be great for them to be able to come in if they get into town. Before they get to your house, you can send them to get a COVID test. If they flunk the test, they have to stay at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They can't stay. So, so I don't see any prep. <laughs> so I don't see any prayer, requ prayer requests coming in, in in our chat, in our comments. So what I like to do then is just turn things over to Paul and just have him, uh, if there's a final word you have for us, I'll see you back next week. Of course, you and I will be, I'll be chat between now and next Wednesday. There's a slight chance that I may be up and going with my first TikTok video. You better be. You better be. <laughs> and But I'll see you next week and we'll talk about what next week looks like. But if Paul, if, you, if there's a final word from the Lord front for us, and then if you'll pray us out, please. Yeah, first up, just let me say what a privilege this has been to be with you guys. And I, I just so love the atmosphere you're fostering here. And it just comes through in what, what you're doing, what your people are saying. And I love it. And and really, if I could say a couple of things, I keep looking at, is it Santaya? Did I pronounce that correctly? Santia. Yeah. yeah. I, Santia? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yes. I just keep seeing that name on the screen and... And I just, you know, I just feel welling up in my spirit, like this idea of, of that generation. I just think God has something really special uh, on, on the millennials and the Gen Zers as a group. Uh, and and it, it's like this. It's like Joshua and Caleb were the young guys that came back from the promised land and said, yeah, you know, we see the giants too, but look at the grapes. You know, let's, let's go after the grapes. Who cares about the giants? And I just see millennials and Gen Zers like that. And I... And I think you're just going to grab onto a promise and you're going to hang on to it and not let go. And God's really going to bless that. And so the mess that we see today, I, I think, is just going to lead to this incredible season of people like Santia. And I just I just really see leadership on you, Santia. And I 
And so I just bless you to go after what's in your heart. I think God approves of you. Part of part of what I think the gift for my wife and I is, is we get to be older people. We're not old, but older, um, affirming this younger generation, these younger people. And so I just affirm who you are. Um, even though I don't know you, I just feel in my spirit that that God has something really amazing, and I affirm that in you. And the and just this dream that you've had, like God is going to bring that to fruition in this next season of your life. And and so where it may have even felt like ah, I, I think I'm going to have to put that dream aside for maybe even for financial purposes. I just feel like God is saying, no, don't. That dream's not to be put aside. And, and you'll know with wisdom how to walk that out because there are seasons for things, but. But even a dream that you may have felt like you have to put aside, I think God's going to bring that thing back into focus. So I just bless you, Santia, and affirm you and affirm that generation. Amen. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And I and for everybody else, you know, in the middle of this crazy time of Jeremiah, maybe my favorite verse in the Bible came forth. And it was Jeremiah 29, 11, And he says to that group of people, hey, you're in a really rough time, but know this, know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you and plans to give you a future and a hope. And I just, I believe that's what God's saying to you right now. I, I believe that that we can pray the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of our household and say, even if things get as dark as they can get, my household can be kept safe. And so I just pray that safety over your households, uh, over your your oikos, which is your circle. That can be your business. That can be your your circle of friends. You get to pray uh, safety over that group of people. And so I, I bless you with that prayer. And I, I bless St. Mark's um, and the atmosphere that's being fostered here by their pastoral team. What you want to do in Wichita that will will emanate throughout the Midwest. I, I I didn't even tell you guys I'm a Midwestern boy growing up, but that's a whole nother story. But I think what you're doing is is like emanating out across the Midwest, impacting Kansas City and and Omaha and and Little Rock and you know just in all directions. And uh, and so we just bless that in you guys. So God, let everything be fulfilled that you have for this group of people in, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Sorry, my phone keeps going off. Well, I thought that was like music you added. <laughs> <laughs> the ambience. Oh, Pastor, that was so awesome. I'm in tears now uh, and just so blessed by tonight. So the final comments, went. just want you to see these and how much you bless us. Thank you, brother. This is absolutely something I, I pray uh, and then that's my wife again, Linda. Yes, a favorite, favorite Bible verse of mine. Thank you for further affirmation. So absolutely. It's been an amazing night. It's been an amazing night. I do want you all to know uh, that again, that he'll be back with us. He said, I asked him, he said that he was, he could, he would be back next Wednesday. So we'll come back and uh, we're going to just continue this conversation even more. Paul, may God bless you and your family and, Amen. and continue to prosper you and give continue to give you boldness and humility and boldness and meekness, courage, and meekness, and, and courage in this, this journey of creativity that you've taken up. Uh, that I know how challenging that can be. I kind of like to live on the edge of creativity. Uh, so I know that can be sometimes it seems like folks are with you, sometimes not. But I pray that God will give you all you and your family courage to uh to, as we say in the black church in the, in the South, run on and see what the end's going to be. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Such an honor. Thank you, guys. All right. Good night, folks. We'll, we will see you. St. Mark will see you all on Sunday. And uh, we'll see you all back here on next Wednesday. One more final comment from Ted Holt, one of our seniors. It was a blessing. Thanks. All right. Good night, folks. Paul, we will hang out just for a second after I end the broadcast and just for a second.